And the thing I want to ask you is, why? What is it that makes us feel so superior to everyone else that we have the right to put people down? Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We're God's Church of Love Online. We are in the end days, y'all. And we want to see what God has to say to us, not only as individuals, as the church of God what he has to say about our character and how influential we don't even realize we are by what we say, by what we do, by what we don't say, what we don't do, and how we carry that out. All right, so we are getting ready to read. So I want you to go with me. James chapter 5, starting at verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Do you hear that? lest ye be condemned. Let me put it in everyday language. Don't be grudging one against another unless you end up being condemned yourselves. All right. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. In other words, you ain't the judge, I ain't the judge, but here come the judge. The judge standeth before the door. The judge is God, not you. The judge is Jesus, not you, not me. Hear me? All right, so let's get off that seat because we are definitely not in the right position. Verse 10, take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, it means yes means yes, your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Because you know what that means. That means, it's Pat's two cents right here, that means that there are a lot of broken promises. So it's best not to promise. I mean, it's best not to vow than to vow and not pay. That's the, be the better way to say it. That's actually a scripture. And a lot of you go against your own words. In these last days, let me, let me, let me add this real quick. Pat's two cents. You know how the Bible says, when sin will abound, the love of many will wax cold. Well, one of the problems we have in these last days is the lack of love, lack of regard for one another. It's all about me. Get out of my way. Hello. You are bugging me right now. I have things I need to do. And I don't have time to worry about you and your problems. So, hello. Goodbye. Hit the road. I've got better things to do. Or I've got bigger fish to fry. And you are small fries. I don't play with small stuff. I've got important places to go, people to see, things to do. Bye. The attitude we have, it's really sad. It I mean the Bible ow, the ow, the Bible prophesies this big time. And what we are dealing with is we are caught up in a place where you could almost say our God is the cell phone. Our God is the internet. We pay homage to it. We pay homage to cyberspace. We pay homage to the almighty dollar, to clout, to power, to influential people, to positions, high positions of high esteem. While we're doing that, we are looking down at many others. We don't always realize we're looking down. 
but we look down because we see ourselves with angel wings. We see ourselves with halos, but we don't realize how broken those halos are. We don't realize how stained and muddied up those wings are. That's why we can't fly and get anywhere because we are a mess, but we don't see that. You know why we don't see what a mess we are? In these last days, baby, we are so blinded to our own mess that we're caught up watching what everyone else is doing wrong. So what do we do as a result of what everyone else is doing wrong? We are casting judgment. We are slandering one another. We're making each other look bad, or let's say look worse <laughs> by these bell clappers between these lips. We're making each other look worse because we are not patient with other people's failures. We're not patient with other people and their weaknesses. And the reason we're not patient with them is because we hold ourselves in such high esteem. And God is looking at us narrowly, baby. Uh, you think you want to take another look in that mirror before you hit the door and get on about your business? You think you want to take another look before you decide to tell someone else how to handle their business? You think you want to take another look? before you open your mouth and say anything to anybody. See, we don't realize how close we are. And the Lord showed me in a lot of ways through a lot of different dreams that when it comes to the rapture, there are going to be a lot less people making it in the rapture than we believe. We think all the Christians, all the kids, all of them, everybody's going to make it to the rapture. All they got to do is believe in Jesus. Well, let me tell you this one thing. There's a scripture that says, even the devils believe. You know what else it says right after that? And tremble. But guess what, y'all? They're not making it into the pearly gates. The devils, the demons, that's what it's talking about. They know. The devil himself knows who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. He'd like to think of him as his rival, even though Jesus has no worthy opponent whatsoever. But the bottom line is, when you look, at what's going on in these last days, you look at the increase of demonic activity. You look at what people are doing, how they're getting involved in witchcraft, how almost every other movie that's coming up on the screens nowadays involve the occult, involve occultic activity, involve magic, potions, formulas, incantations, casting spells, witchcraft, voodoo, the Ouija board, tarot cards, telling fortunes, psychics, the whole nine yards. It all involves all of that. And do you notice it's going to an all-time high? It almost reminds me of those, those tornadoes where it looks really narrow down where we are. But the higher you look, the bigger that sucker is. And that's the way this witchcraft and demonic activity is going on. Right is wrong. Wrong is right. Am I right or wrong, y'all? Mm -hmm. All right. So we have to be very careful and guard our hearts. Because we can get swept up. See, there, there's demonic activity that's going on that's so subtle. You don't even realize it. You don't realize it. I was doing a rant in my car last night on a, on camera. And I'm going to do a little portion of it and, and include it with this message. 
But one of those rants was how leaders of churches don't even realize that they are being used by the devil. They think they're anointed by God because they hold the Bible in their hand. They think they're anointed by God because they're, re ow! they're reading scripture. They think they're anointed by God because they are saying the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, listen to this, y'all. Why is it when you look at the different churches? Think about this one. Why is it every time you turn around, you got a pastor in the pulpit preaching a word. I'm not going to say the word of God. They're preaching a word. And when they're preaching a word, guess what they're preaching about? They call it preaching. They're talking about some big name pastor somewhere in some big mega church that's been called out who have maybe they've been exposed maybe judgment is on their life maybe uh they have had a lot of hidden secrets that are now coming out into the light and everybody is saying oh, did you hear well guess what you pastors are doing the same thing across the pulpit you're gossiping you're backbiting you're slandering your brothers in Christ. How dare you? How dare you do that? Who do you think you are? You got your own congregation to deal with. You got your own mess and secrets going on in your own group to be worried about what somebody else is doing. You're all that concerned? It bothers you that much? Get your behind on your knees and cry out to God for them. Instead of getting up in the pulpit, backbiting and talking about them. They are not the gospel. Jesus is. What are you doing sitting up there preaching about what somebody else is doing wrong? You want to point out sins? You want to point out how ugly certain sins are? Guess what? You get up in that pulpit and you share your own sins. You share your own failures, your own faults and weaknesses. And then share God's power to overcome from experience by the word of God. You share, baby, but you share with hope. You share letting them know there's hope for them when they falter and they fall. Not running around pointing the finger from the pulpit. How dare you? The devil can anoint anybody who opens that door. And some of you preachers have opened that door to the devil. You know why? You talk about other preachers who have fallen flat on their faces. You tell their business. You use the gospel to gossip about your brothers and sisters, the leaders of the churches. You are sitting there being judge, jury, and executioner as you highlight all that they have fallen into, as you, you actually consider that a sermon. That's what I don't get. You're not preaching Jesus and him crucified. You're not preaching living a holy life. You're not preaching the ins and outs and the ways of doing spiritual warfare, according to Ephesians chapter 6. You're not doing things like teaching them about godly character and wisdom and using the right methods and the right motives pertaining to Proverbs, uh, 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 just Proverbs, period. You're not using the Bible to help people grow. You're using the Bible as a whip to tear down your brothers and sisters who are in the pulpit, who have fallen from grace because they have fallen into sexual promiscuity. They have fallen into financial um, squ squander, whatever you want to call it, greed, whatever. They have fallen into pride. Well, guess what, baby cakes? You have too. 
The minute you opened your mouth against your brother or your sister, the minute you decided to blast their business on the front page and make them look bad, you're just as guilty. The minute you decided to turn the gospel into gossip, right across that pulpit with the Bible in hand, you have become a sower of discord because people should not be hearing about it. They should be praying about it. And if you're not praying about it, something's wrong. If you're not praying about your brothers and sisters, your congregation should not hear about it. And the only way they should hear about anything should be, I know you've probably heard about brother so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, bishop, whatever. Sister so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, minister, whatever. We need to gather around the altar, y'all. We need to pray for the leaders of our churches. That's it. You don't have to rehash. You don't have to repeat what was on the front page. You don't have to tell them, oh yeah, well, they did this and they did that and they're not doing this right and they're not doing that right. You know what? God straightened me out years ago and I'm going to use the same thing to straighten you. You read Isaiah, I think it's 64, that talks about our righteousness being filthy rags. I want you to check that one out. Matter of fact, I'm going to read it to you. And this is going to be a short message. But this is part of the traps we fall into in these last days. And we think we're going to make it through the rapture. But all the stuff you're doing right now is going to have you sitting flat on your fanny while you're looking, watching all the people disappear while you're still here to go through the tribulation. Okay, I want you to go with me to Isaiah 64. This is the dangerous turf that we're living in right here. And you don't even realize it. It's really, really, really sad. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Isaiah 64, starting at uh, verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither have the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him that rejoices and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. And those is continuance. That, that's nonstop. And we shall be saved. Thank God for that. Verse 6. Here we go, right here. And I'm going to read it the way the Lord read it to me years ago when he was getting on my case when I was fussing about a leader in the church. Thank God I was fussing to God, not to somebody else. He set me straight. But we are all as an unclean thing. Now, before I go any further, what is the first thing that jumped to me off, off that page? The word A-L-L. -L. I will never forget it. I mean, the Holy Spirit slapped me all upside my face with that three-letter word. But we all, we are all as an unclean thing. That means you, me, everybody else. That includes me and you and everybody else and you. <laughs> Surprise! Take the halo off. We are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there's none that calleth upon thy name that sitteth, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee for thou hast hid thy face from us and has consumed us because of our iniquities. <laughs> but now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay and thou our potter. And we all are the work 
of thy hands. Now, I'm going to stop there. I want you to think about that word all. When you start to look at the leaders, and you start to look at this one, that one, the other one, and you think, hmm, hypocrite. Guess what God is looking at you saying? Hmm. When you get up in that pulpit, and you talk about, don't listen to them, they did this, and they did that. I can almost picture God pulling out this long, mile long scroll saying, would you like me to read all of your sins and failures to the same congregation you just read theirs to? Hmm. See, you think you're going to up, up and away. Yeah. No. No, it's not going to happen that way. Because number one, you're not preaching God's word in the right spirit. You're not preaching it in love. Love does not uncover sin. Love covers a multitude of sin. So why are you, ask yourself this, why are you pulling the blanket off? Why are so many of you in the body of Christ, just the members themselves, themselves running around, blasting, people's personal business, why do you feel the need to do that? Hmm? She wasn't always like that. I remember her when she was, uh, <laughs> you remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why are we like that? Could it possibly be jealousy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could it possibly be resentment? Because your church is small and they've got a mega church. Your money's funny, but hey, they got money coming out the yin yang. Could it possibly be jealousy? Think about your motives, why you do what you do, why you say what you say. See, what happens is we think that because we are part of the body of Christ, we are a shoe in. Now, there's a scripture that says, uh, ha, ha, ha. yeah, this is kind of, this kind of where we're going, y'all. Oh, sorry, my shoulders have been hurting. And, and every once in a while, I got to be careful how I move. God told me he's going to heal it. So I just got to go through the process of getting from the pain to the gain. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wondrous, wonderful works? Verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. See, that's not addressed just to the folks who have fallen into sin, who may have already asked God to forgive them and they're working on getting it back together. No, they may be addressing those of you who love blasting their sins. Because the Bible says love covers a multitude of sin, but you're sitting up there calling yourself a loving leader and you're quick to uncover a multitude of sin, to put it on the front page and let everybody know about it. 24, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And of course, that rock symbolizes Jesus. You know, we think that we're going to make it in because we know the name of Jesus. And we think that because we said, quote unquote, the sinner's prayer, that that covers us. You know, we can go do whatever we want to do, say whatever we want to say. You know what, y'all, you better clean up your act now. Because the rapture is on its way. It's right around the corner. 
and you are putting yourself in a very precarious, very dangerous, very unwise position when you hold that finger up, that little bony finger, and you point it at this one, that one, or the other one. Stop judging. Judge not lest ye be judged. That's one of those little foxes that will spoil your vine when the rapture comes. And when it comes and goes, you'll still be sitting on your fanny playing with your vine. Mm -hmm. And wondering, how did you get left behind? How could God have forgotten you? There's his answer right there. Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, if you go with the word new, when you think about that word, you realize that the word new really has a conjugal meaning to it, which means if you picture a husband and wife and they make love, the husband plants the seed, the woman gets pregnant, she bears a child. That is the fruit of her labor. Well, it's the same way with us and God. When we become one with God, our love captures the union which where the Holy Spirit plants the seed and we bear the fruit. So what fruit do we bear? Seeds, fruits of holiness. We bear fruits of holiness. And as a result of the holiness, the, pro the productivity, what we are doing in essence afterwards is also bearing witness to what we have gotten from God making more results, which means that we are adding children to the kingdom of God as a result of our oneship with God in holy matrimony, so to speak. So if you're not bearing fruits of righteousness, you need to check your soil to see if you have had any seeds really planted. Or is your soil barren? void of God. And you go at what it really means. It's really, it's, it's depicting a marriage, a marriage union where there, it's a conjugal connection. See, you can't just know about him. You can't just read about him. We read about the pre president of the United States. We read about the candidates. We read about the politicians, the governors running for office, the mayors running for office. We read about them, but we don't know them, baby. No, we don't know them like their spouses know them. There's an intimacy there. There's time spent. You know the gestures. You know how they think. You can almost predict what's, what's coming out of their mouths, what their attitude is when this happens or that happens, because you know them. Most of you can honestly say to this day, you don't know God. You may preach about him. You may read about him. You may pray to him. You may talk about him. You may testify about the things he's done in your life. But if you were really, really honest, you don't know him. I remember when I first got saved, one of the strongest prayers that I kept praying was, Lord, I don't love you. I don't know you. I want to love and know you, and I want to know that you love and know me. I don't want that to be up in the air. I can't just live this life believing in you. I need to know you. I need a connection. That's what that means when he says, I never knew you. You never connected with me. There was no relationship with me. There was no intimacy with me. Hmm. Do you know him, y'all? We're moving into the moment of the rapture. Do you know him? If he entered your car, if his manifest presence entered your living room, would you know him? Hmm. 
If you're going through a bad time, a bad situation, a painful situation, a difficult trial, would you know him when he ministers to you? Would you even know that he's there encouraging you? See, there's a part of walking with the Lord that goes way beyond the rewards, y'all. You got to know him. When you know him, you love him. You can't help it because you experience him. There's so much to God that we have just touched the tip of the iceberg. I have experienced his love. I have experienced him keeping me company. I have experienced him speaking to me. But guess what? And warning me in dreams. I still have only touched the tip of the iceberg. I keep saying, Lord, show me more of you. Show me more. I want to see that supernatural, that 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 everlasting, eternal side that, that goes beyond my world. I want to see more. But do you care to? Or is your cell phone enough for you? Hmm? Is the town gossip exciting enough for you? It takes work to dig in and get close to God. He's there. But it's up to us to do the digging, the seeking, the asking, the knocking. It's up to us. He's not going to take us any closer than we desire to be. So my question to you in these last days, what is your desire? What do you really want? Huh? What do you really want? Would you be satisfied with God being your all in all if all this was taken from you? If all your rights were taken away? Would you lean on him that much harder or would you blame him for it all? See, when you know God, you know his heart. But I'm going to tell you right now, and I'm going to end real quick. The way to know God's heart, to at least become familiarized with it, is reading his word. You better start there. You better start spending more time talking to him. Because when the rapture comes, there's going to be a shift in the atmosphere, y'all. And his people are going to know something's up. Something's getting ready to happen. I feel something. Mm. But how can you feel it if you don't know it? If you've never experienced. How can you enjoy ice cream if you've never tasted it? How can you know what salty tastes like if you've never tasted salt? How can you know food with seasoning if you've never experienced all the spices that people can put in food to enrich the flavor? Mm. How can you know color if you've been blind all your life? And God is multifaceted, y'all. But many of you are too blind to see the first facet, his love. Last days, y'all, get ready. Things are getting ready to shift. Things are getting ready to shake, quake, rake, shake, rattle, and roll. Are you ready? Are you ready to cross over? Are you ready to enter another realm with him? Or are you going to be sitting here on your fanny saying, oh, when you realize people have disappeared, boop, they're gone just like that. And you know, you know what's going on because you cast out devils. You prophesied in his name. You've done many wonderful works in his name. Hmm. I'm leaving you with that thought. I want to introduce you to my new book that I wrote after I got my doctorate in eschatological studies, a dramatic paraphrased commentary on the book of Revelation and end times prophecy. Check it out.